Good morning and welcome back. My name is Redouan Gansat. I'm a research engineer at Institut Pierre Simon Laplace in Sorbonne University in Paris. And I'm actually very happy and privileged to have with us Professor Rashid Garawi for the first talk of Morocco AI conference. Uh, Rashid Garawi is a professor in computer science in, at EPFL, where he leads the laboratory of distributed computing. He worked in the past with the Col des Mines de Paris, uh, à Saclay, HP Labs in Palo Alto, and MIT. He has been elected ACM Fellow and Professor of the Collège de France. He was awarded a senior ERC grant and a Google-focused award, and was also a member of the Nouveau Model de Development. I am very happy to have you here, Rachid Garawi. Uh, hi, C. Rachid. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edouane. Uh, the I'm... floor is yours. Uh, the title I'm just given a reminder. The title is Artificial Intelligence. Let's get serious. Okay, the floor is yours, Serashi. Yes. So Artificial Intelligence, Let's Get Serious. That's that's the title. Of course, when you, when you need to send a title to some organizer, you need something sexy and attractive. And at that time, when Redouane asked me, uh, I was thinking that there were many, many people talking about AI without maybe necessarily knowing what it is and, and sometimes without caring what it is, just the fact that AI is an acronym that attracts attention. So it is important to be able to use acronyms that attract, attract attention, which is what this great uh, consortium of, of students, researchers, Moroccan researchers are doing. I think that's very important. As long as you know that you are using an acronym to attract attention. So what I mean by let's be serious about AI, I mean two or three things I would like to share with you uh, this morning. The first thing is what is AI? And I think it's sometimes important to sit down, take your time and, and ask yourself, what, what are we talking about? Uh, my, my thesis is that AI is, is, is really something that is synonymous to computer science. Uh, what do I mean by that? If you look at the first times people started talking about AI, it's a long time ago. In fact, it's much longer than what, what, what we typically uh, consider in the books of history of the field. I think the, the Pascaline, which is the machine that Blaise Pascal invented, I think that was a long time ago. So Blaise Pascal was, was an engineer working in France, a mathematician and uh, an inventor. And he was seeing his father uh, doing additions every evening because his father was a tax, uh, tax person doing something for the king of France. So this is a long time ago. And Blaise Pascal was, was thinking, why should my father be spending all his energy doing these stupid additions? Addition was at that time considered easy because it's, we knew the algorithm of Al-Khawarizmi with the numbers, we could do addition in a simple manner. So Blaise Pascal was thinking, if we can do that in a stupid manner, maybe a machine can do it. So he created a machine, Pascaline, and the machine started doing the additions instead of Blaise Pascal's father. What is interesting is that in those days, the church of France decided, uh, was very upset because the church considered that addition was something that only humans could do. And the fact that a machine can replace the human was considered as an act of the devil, so shaitan. And Blaise Pascal actually constructed 13 machines, Pascali, that he was planning to sell them, but the church burned them. And the church considered that to be artificial intelligence. And that was uh, several centuries ago. So why, is the, why did the church consider that? Because for the church and for many people in France in those days, the machine replaced the human, or more specifically, the machine could solve a problem that we believed, or human uh, being believed, that only human could solve that problem. So artificial intelligence, my definition, it's not my definition. The definition I'm using here is when a machine solves a problem that we believe is only a problem that a human can solve. In fact, this definition is uh, the definition of Alan Turing. So Alan Turing posed the question precisely of what is artificial intelligence in 1952, uh, if my memory is correct. Can machines think? And he, he, he came up with exactly the definition I'm talking to you about. 
when a machine, in fact, what Alan Turing defined as a machine in his paper 1936, is actually an algorithm executing on the Turing machine. So let me take uh, open a bracket again here. I told you that Blaise Pascal built this machine that does addition. A uh, few years later, Leibniz also built a machine, but Leibniz's machine was doing multiplication. Interestingly, Pascal's machine and Leibniz's machine were both inspired by Al Khawarizmi's book on algebra, because in, in that book, there were recipes of how to do addition, recipes of how to do multiplication. And what Pascal and then Leibniz did is hardwire the addition um, algorithm and the multiplication algorithm inside the machine. So those were very specialized machines. And it took several centuries until Alan Turing came and asked himself the question, why is it that uh, a machine can only do one thing, whereas a human being, we can explain to him or her like a kid, here is the algorithm for addition, and then the kid will digest the algorithm and execute it. And then here is the algorithm of multiplication, the kid will digest the algorithm and execute it. Alan Turing said to himself, why can't we build a machine that does that? Just like human beings. So he built his Turing machine. Again, the goal was to have a machine that behaves like human to digest the algorithm as data. And that's fundamental. So before Alan Turing, there was the algorithm, was the machine, but the data was outside. Alan Turing came with this idea that the data and the algorithm are the same thing. We give to the machine the data plus multiplication, addition, what have you, and the machine will digest the data and actually the algorithm is the data executed. That was in 1936. And this is what we call uh, the, the universal machine of Alan Turing. If you are doing computer science and artificial intelligence, whatever that means, you need to know this history. So a few years after inventing his machine, Alan Turing asked himself, what does it mean for a machine to think? Because people were, again, going back to Pascal's time and talking about that. And his definition was, a machine thinks, we say that a machine is intelligence if it appears to be, if it behaves, if it does something that we believe only human can do. Of course, uh, today, nobody would look at a calculator and say, oh, this is artificial intelligence, because we consider that addition is easy. Multiplication, the same. But you have to go back a little bit to history. So, for example, after World War II, there was a fight between uh, the Cold War, between uh, the Soviet Union and the US. And one of the, the areas where they were fighting was the chess game. It was considered a sign of intelligence and the Russians or the Soviets were beating the Americans. Uh, until IBM and Carnegie Mellon, the university, uh, joined forces and built a machine that could actually beat the, 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 the Soviets, the champions, Kasparov. And then we said, wow, a machine that can uh, beat a humans, the champions in chess, that is artificial intelligence. But then a few years later, and even now, and now in particular, nobody will consider chess as artificial intelligence. Why? Because we consider chess as something simple. It's not only something that humans can do. As uh, John Ma McCarthy said, whenever it works, it's not AI anymore. So when we get surprised, we say it's AI. When, when surprises goes, it's not AI anymore. And then we came to the Go uh, game, for example. And then we said, no, no, the Go game, this is really intelligence because the number of possibilities is huge. A machine will not be able to solve this problem. This is intelligence. And of course, we know that uh, the machines could actually beat the champions in the Go game. And in the beginning, we say this is artificial intelligence. We still say it's artificial intelligence, especially in the, in the latest generation of AlphaGo, where the machine learns just as alone by unsupervised learning. And that is called artificial intelligence. But as you will see in a few years, nobody will care about that. Nobody, no, not, not nobody will care about that. Nobody will call that artificial intelligence. What I'm saying here is the following. It's an acronym that's very nice. Uh, it enables you to organize this event. It enables to attract money when you apply for, for uh, grants and things like that. But it is first and above all computer science. It's algorithms slash data. As I told you, it's the same thing, according to Turing, the inventor of the field, plus technology. 
And whenever this combination algorithms technology surprises us, then we say it's AI, fine. But we need to remember what it is really, it's algorithm plus data. So it is important also to ask ourselves, okay, we, we have, or we as a, the, the, the researchers in the field, they could beat humans in chess, they could build human in Go, they could do poker, they could do this, they could do that. But can they do really beyond these uh, exploits, uh, au-delà de ces exploits, est-ce que l'intelligence artificielle réalise des choses vraiment imp importantes pour l'humanité, est-ce qu'elle réalise des applications pratiques And this is crucial, because one thing is to say, yes, we could beat this champion in this or that. But the other thing is to say, yes, but now there are applications of what has been called AI that are very useful. Word processing is extremely useful, but it has never been called AI. Excel sheets, I don't think it has ever been called AI. So is there something really today that we can claim to be, in, in fact, the question is, Uh, did we really move from games and exploits like that to actual applications? And in particular, critical applications, because games, if, you, if the algorithm doesn't work, is not a big deal. If you go to health, driving, et cetera, now becoming serious, now it's become critical. And, and there is something that I really advise you to pay attention to. So far, most of what has been called AI has been used for some games and things like that. And it's only now that we are closely moving to long-lived critical applications. Now, there is a common characteristic of what is called uh, today AI, besides the fact that it surprises us, it's a new category of algorithms. It's, as you all know, machine learning algorithms where we heavily rely on data. So let me stop here again for a minute. If I, I told you about the algorithm of addition, The algorithm of addition, you can execute it 10,000 times. It's the same algorithm. It's not going to change its output. The algorithms that we have been using recently, for example, AlphaGo and others, the more you play, the more you consume the data, the better the algorithm is. So it's, it's a different kind of algorithm. It's machine learning algorithm. So if machine learning is something we can define precisely. We can, I try to give a definition here, which is the more data you use, the more likely it's uh, the algorithm will give better inputs or more generally the the algorithm actually depends is modified according to the data it consumes so this is very powerful but it also creates a vulnerability which i will talk about uh, now now i'm going to share my slides if i if i can to tell you just one field of research so this is my Second, the second part of my talk. The first part of, of my talk was to tell you there is something we can define precisely, which is machine learning. Algorithms that somehow improve based on the number of times we execute them, which is different from addition, multiplication, etc. And these algorithms, they have this characteristic, the machine learning algorithms, that they depend on the data. And we want these algorithms to go beyond games and to start being applied to more important areas like health or, and many people will talk about that. We want to do health oriented machine learning, driving, etc. So let me uh, go back to the basics. When we talk about machine learning, what we basically say is we want to optimize some function. I'm not going into details now, but this is what we try to do. We want to know, we want to learn a model based on data, roughly speaking, Based on what we have seen in the past, we want to generalize functions that will predict the future, of course, based on what we have seen. So this is optimization problems. The, when we want to move to big systems that will enable us to consume a lot of data and be able to drive, to, to, to cure people, etc., uh, comes a technological problem. And, and I cannot insist enough machine learning or AI or what have you is a combination of data algorithms and technology. So when we want to handle a huge amount of data, we want to recognize images, for example, cancer, tumors, or whatever, then this, this will work because we want to have, we want to consume a lot of data. We need many machines. You can take even huge machines today, they cannot cope with the amount of data that you need in order to predict uh, skin cancer or things like that. So you need a large number of, of, of machines. And usually you have 
huge models. Huge models means actually a, a large number of parameters because you have all kinds of features, the color of the skin, the form, the volume, this and that. So what it means is that th this leads to what is called distributed machine learning. What, what is distributed machine learning is simply this idea that instead of having only one machine handling everything, we will have we will share the load of the data on several machines. So this is uh, also an idea that is almost as old as computer science. When you want to be faster and, uh, and, and treat more information, you distribute the load on several machines. But as soon as you do that, problems happen. But first, how do you typically do that? So for example, in machine learning, the way people are doing that today, so they typically have what is called the parameter server architecture. You have a server, a bunch of nodes, you distribute the data on the nodes, and you basically uh, leverage all these machines to treat different parts of the data, and then you average. So the, this picture on the right, on my right, typically you have a server that sends uh, a model to the nodes. They do some work, they send back gradients. And then what you do is you average the gradients. If you are not into these things, it's not important. What's important at this point is large number of data that are distributed. But uh, of course, what, what you should know, if you know technology, and I cannot insist enough, is that you know that machines fail, no matter how, how clean they are, no matter how, how, how smart you are in writing your code, they might be behave, misbehavior. The misbehavior can come from the data that you have put, which maybe is not, is not good, it's, it's poisonous, we say. Maybe the node itself fails. So for example, you, you, you look at Google machines today, 10% out of them misbehave per day. This is huge, huge, enormous. And these are companies that spend a lot of money buying and making sure the machines are good. Sometimes it's network. So the, the big question here is, can we build uh, machine learning schemes that tolerates the misbehavior of some of, of a subset of the data, the machine, the network? Of course, if the entire network, the entire data is corrupt, then you cannot do anything. But we have observed that sometimes it's like 10%, 12%, 8% of the data, the machines are not working properly. And the big question, the important question is, can we build a Byzantine, what we call Byzantine learning? The word Byzantine comes from Leslie Lamport, uh, a Turing Award winner, who defined this field of distributed computing despite a subset of the nodes not behaving properly. And this is an important concept. When you want to move from just doing games to doing something critical. Because if you are just building an algorithm for chess, if it doesn't work, you say, oh, I will repeat. Sorry, we will just repeat the game. It's just the learning. Ta -ta 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 -ta. But if you are doing something very critical, like healthcare driving, you need to be able to tolerate a subset of failures. Now, if you think about a little bit uh, what this means without going into, into the details, in the previous slides, I told you that the classical way to do distributed learning is to average. Now, if you have one machine, even out of 100, that gives you completely crazy data. So for example, you're measuring temperatures. Most of the machines tell you the temperature is 15, the other one 14, 13, and then one machine tells you the temperature is 2000. If you average, then of course your average is going to be very wrong. It's not going to be wrong, it's going to be very wrong. So we say that this scheme is very vulnerable, okay? So this one node or one data or one misbehavior that can come from the software, from the hardware, has basically screwed up your entire computation. And the goal of this field of research that I have been working on with others for the last 15 years or for 10 years maybe, <clears throat> maybe not 10 years, eight years, is how to make sure your computation is correct despite the misbehavior of some machines. So this is indeed something I have been working on for 30 years, but for, in the context of machine learning, maybe the last seven or eight years. Uh, there are general techniques to address this problem, but the general techniques that have been applied to general purpose computing are too expensive for machine learning. So here, what we have been doing is try to find some schemes that basically make this aggregation part, which we typically have done using averaging in a more robust manner. So for example, you use, uh, you replace averaging with what is called trimmed mean, for instance. And here, what you would require is that the output 
should lie in the convex hull of honest inputs. So this is the intuition. Roughly speaking, what we want to do is to say, if we have a small percentage of bad machines, this should not impact too much the, the general computation or millimeter, uh, minimum diameter averaging, which is a robust form of averaging. The output is the best possible estimate of the honest averages. So these uh, functions that I'm talking about are functions that would be executed at that parameter server, who is, which is aggregating values. So instead of doing averaging, you do these things. Of course, this might look simple, but it's not that simple. The two aggregation rules that I just mentioned are ex extremely expensive in high dimension. And as I pointed out, whenever you go to critical application, you definitely have a large number of parameters and high dimension. So the, the plan in, in this research agenda, because it's a research agenda, I'm, I'm simply saying we have started looking at this, but, but the road ahead is, is full of challenges, is to try to look, for example, or discover aggregation rules that make the minimum uh, assumptions on the, on the data and the machines in particular, the variance, the exponential distribution, and so forth, while tolerating the maximum number of faulty nodes. We call them sometimes Byzantine. And the, the, the original uh, robust aggregation rules, uh, we have developed a couple in the lab. So for example, Chrome and Multichrome with Mehdi Mohamdi, Piva Blanchard, and Julien Steiner. This is something we, we initiated, but there are a lot of work in this area. I'm, I'm going to skip. Uh, uh, these these things, but what, what I'm trying to say here is that this field is extremely important. It's important to devise robust machine learning schemes that will enable you to tolerate a subset of misbehavior from data network, etc. There are some uh, also other ideas besides the aggregation. The aggregation is something that executes at this parameter server. But there are other things that are other tricks or mechanisms that we discover. For example, the very notion of momentum inspired from statistics. If you use it properly among the, the nodes that are doing the job, roughly speaking, if, if something is going in the right direction, then you don't start from scratch in the other iteration. So as if we were gluing the iterations. For those of you who are not into distributed SGD, you don't need to worry about this. I'm simply saying, there are some schemes and mechanisms to go towards uh, critical, uh, robust uh, aggregation rules. We have also uh, made some experiments. And in fact, uh, the lab in Switzerland at EPFL has developed a library that has been uh, used with the TensorFlow and, and PyTorch to improve it with, with libraries of, of uh, robust aggregation and uh, Byzantine uh, distributed, learning, or distributed learning. So this is the, the team I have in, in Lausanne with people working in this area. They are all from the uh, different kinds of the planets. Raphael is from Sorbonne, Nirupayam is from India, Yusuf is uh, Moroccan from Polytechnique of Paris, Sadiq is from Sharif, and John is from Lebanon. But I'm also collaborating with another team in Morocco at the University Mohammed VI Polytechnique, where people are also working in this area. There is Alexandre Morer from Ecole Normale, who is now in Morocco. There is uh, the various people working in this, some very smart students. So I really encourage you to look uh, at this area, which is robust machine learning, because I believe this is would bridge the gap between games and, and fun applications and uh, machine learning. And this is hence the title of my talk, which is let's take uh, AI seriously. So take AI seriously means define it properly, know what it is, and try to get some interesting research problems. And in order to get the interesting research problems, I really believe that it's important to mix uh, technology as well as mathematics and statistics. There is another angle which I didn't mention here, which is that of privacy, okay? So here I told you that it's important to make sure you tolerate a subset of faulty machines. But what if in addition, you say, I want to tolerate a subset of faulty nodes, but I also want to make sure that the data stored at every node is not, cannot be recovered, neither by the parameter server nor by other nodes. And that introduce an interesting dimension to the problem which is that of privacy, because it is expected, I believe, in the near future, that this model I presented of parameter server will be replaced by a completely peer-to-peer -peer model. We will all have our machines, 
and we will learn from each other. So for example, if I go to Tarazu to surf, maybe automatically my phone will be connected to the phone of somebody else and that phone will exchange surfing spot information with my, with my phone and they will learn from each other. That's very interesting, but that would be uh, really uh, serious if we can tolerate, if we can make sure that the data remains private, we don't share exactly the entire information, we add some noise, etc., and we tolerate malicious players or faulty players. I think that's the future of machine learning, in my opinion, but we need to take it seriously by assuming that some parts will fail and, and collapse. To conclude, let me just uh, thank the organizer and give a message to especially the young generation of, of you who are listening to, to my talk and to this conference. Uh, my really main message is whatever you call it, AI, ML, etc. What's important is really to do something uh, what I would call impactful. And there are only two kinds of impacts. Either you do research and you write papers, you try to publish them in if you are working in this field, ICML, NeurIPS, ICLR, uh, ASTATS, etc. Or you are doing something practical. If you are doing something practical, if you are in Morocco, then go to uh, OCP, Tijari Wafa Bank, uh, BMC, etc. Try to convince them that what you are doing has an impact. But don't stay in the this is the worst position. You say, oh, I have an idea. I'm going to think about the idea. No, no, write it carefully, submit it to a conference or a journal, or try to contact industry, try to convince them that your idea is, is important. Of course, it takes a lot more energy, but at the end, this is what will, will change your life. Thank you for your attention, and good luck for the rest of the week. Thanks a lot, dear Professor Gurawi. A really interesting talk and very thought provoking. So now we'll move to the questions. Actually, we did receive a lot of questions, but uh, for the sake of time, we'll need to select some of them. So I'll go uh, straight to the first question. So the first question is quite general. Uh, it says the reason why people don't agree on a single definition of AI comes from the fact that there is not a single definition of intelligence. In general, intelligence is a way to first abstract thinking and reasoning, and on our or problem solving and ability. In your opinion, uh, Professor Gerawi, is AI more related to the first aspect, abstract thinking and reasoning, or the second one, problem solving ability? So uh, to, for, for the sake of time, let me tell you that, uh, in fact, my personal humble answer to, the, to this question is not important. What I'm trying to say at the end of my talk is, Take the definition you like. My definition is that of Alan Turing. So I suggest that you read Alan Turing's paper. But what is most important is do something impactful. Don't, don't worry about the definition. Just do something. I have seen many people spending hours arguing, what is machine learning? What is AI? We don't care. Just do it. I really love the answer. And actually, it's very related to the second question, I think, because the second question says... For example, in AI, uh, in history, we try to um, understand how to mimic human intelligence. So do you think that currently we should still deal with these philosophical questions or just move to more practical applications and impactful technological innovations? I think you, you already actually answered. But, uh, but yeah, um, in, a, in a related question, maybe because you mentioned John McCarthy and you mentioned when, when he says that when it's actually working, it's not AI anymore. So um, can we still, for example, if you want actually to discuss with, with decision makers, we need to use the AI words and the, the buzzwords, as, as you said. Um, so do we, what do you think about this, this actually way of using AI buzzword terms, especially when discussing with decision makers? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you need to be smart. You need to tell them, yeah, yeah, I'm doing AI, but, but you have to do something. If, if you are just talking about it, the decision makers will listen to you once, but they're not going to listen to you twice. If you tell them, I'm using AI to cure cancer, and then indeed you develop an application to cure cancer, bingo, then you did something useful. But unfortunately, there are many cases where the discussion remains philosophical. If you want to do philosophy, fine. But if you are to do mathematics, computer science, then do something concrete. Either you come up with the new algorithm to optimize this or that function, or you come up with an application. Don't stay in the middle. 
All right, thanks, uh, dear uh, Professor Gere. We, we actually have another question and it's also a more philosophical question. So we, we do have a lot of philosophical questions for you, uh, dear uh, Professor Gere. So it's more on the um, symbolic AI versus connectionist AI and what's your take on the subject? Yeah, my, my, again, my, my take is symbolic AI is great. When I was when I was younger, I was uh, completely crazy. I wanted to do theory improving with AI. I was also doing a deva in the place where you are. It used to be called Parisis, and that was the goal. Can we prove theorems using AI? So it was pure logic. It was fantastic, but I didn't I did realize that it was really 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 hard. So again, my recommendation to you is wait until you retire to do philosophy and now just uh, do something concrete. Thank you very much. Do you have any last words actually for the Morocco AI community in general? Well, the, 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 my take is really uh, research, for those of you who want to do research, is about sweating, c'est de la transpiration. Of course, when we are kid, we were, we were told, for example, that Newton was laying under a tree and he got an apple and he discovered gravity. That's wrong. He did not, he was not lying. He was working like a dog. We were told that Archimed was on, on his bat and then he felt the water pushing him, hence la poussée d'Archimed. That is wrong. Research is about sweating. You have to work hard. You have to write papers. You have to experiment. So this is what my, my last word to you, work hard. So, um... Another question. So do Morocco need a national strategy right now? People do, do try to do something, for example, concrete to cure cancer or other application, but the, there is no data, for example, and access to data is hard. So what's also your take about this? I mean, difficulties and challenges. Yeah, very difficult to answer because my friend Malik Ghalab will talk about, with about, about the topic. Again, if I look at strategies in France, for example, they said, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, etc. cetera. I, I sometimes, je reste sur ma fin. I, I feel that this is a, a much ado about nothing, as, as Shakespeare puts it. So if we have a strategy, for example, for doing healthcare with computer science, that's concrete. We can measure it. We can say, okay, we did this, it gave this and that. But if we simply say we want a general strategy for football, we can measure it. Did we go to the can? Did we win the can? Did we... But if we say a general strategy for AI, how are we going to measure it? If you cannot measure something, then you cannot do it right. So healthcare, yes, maybe we can do uh, transportation or automatic driving because we have these factories in the north. That, can, that is concrete. If we simply say general strategy for AI, I'm a little bit afraid it's, it's a dead project. All right, so uh, thanks a lot, dear Professor Garewi, for your time and your insights. It was really a thought-provoking <laughs> talk and very, very interesting. So thanks to all the um, participants. So um, yeah, me, let's meet again for the talk of, of Professor Melik Khalab and uh, see you.